It's time to begin. It's <laughs> look out at those parts. <laughs> um, as I, I like to encourage folks to do during the prelude is to uh, to invite God to to meet with you during this worship time and and to speak to you and invite God or, or ask for ears that can hear what God is saying. So let us prepare our hearts for worship. Greetings, Presbyterian Church of Dover, members, friends, the few that are here in person and the many, hopefully many that are watching live streaming online. You know, it's, it's uh, strange for a pastor to say, glad to see so few people, uh, but given the nature of uh, COVID right now, that's uh, exactly the way I feel. Good to see so few people. And normally when you have a 
this few, you say, gather closer together, but no, no, stay far apart. Uh, but let us gather now for our worship. Um, you know, be sure to check the, uh, the announcements in the bulletin because a few things have been canceled due to COVID, due to uh, people not, be, uh, uh, not meeting in person right, at the, right now. So keep, keep an eye on that. And uh, that's mainly the announcements right now. As I like to say, when we enter into worship, whoever you are and wherever you are on your faith's journey, you are welcome here. And we pray that the transforming love of Jesus might touch your life today. And we want to pass the peace among one another, doing it in our pews and not spreading around. Uh, you, got, you, you, know the, you know how we do it now. But the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Also with you. Let us pass the peace. Good morning. Good morning. Will you join me responsively in the call to worship? God built the heavens, the earth, and everything in them. God calls us to be builders as well. God calls us to build our lives. To restore broken places and continue to grow. God calls us to build our faith. To study the word and ponder its interpretation. God calls us to build our community. To build bridges of understanding. God calls us to build history by fulfilling the promises of the scripture. To preach good news of God's love and liberation for all people. Now join me in the opening prayer. We are gathered here now, O oh God, because you love us and have given us life through your son Jesus. So we come together to worship you and praise your name. We ask that you make your presence very real to us this day, and that you empower us with the Holy Spirit. Help us to have the right priorities in our daily living, so that in our daily lives we might serve you and work for your kingdom. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. <laughs>
Now hear the call to confession. Let us confess our sin as an offering of our trust in God's love and forgiveness for us. Please join me in the prayer of confession. God of our restoration, whenever we come home to you, we realize how far we have strayed and how much we have forgotten your law and your love. We have not loved you with our whole hearts or loved our neighbors as ourselves. Forgive us, heal us, and restore us to our relationship with you through Jesus Christ, in whom we trust. Amen. God's word does not come to condemn us, but to make us wise, reviving our souls and rejoicing in our hearts. God's word has been fulfilling among us in Jesus Christ, who set us free to live in accord with God's own So let us receive now the gifts that we have uh, given to support the work of this church and uh, to the glory of God. Let us stand and sing the doxology. Thank you, O oh God, for the many blessings that you have given us and for the opportunity to share what you've given us to support the work of this church and the building of your kingdom. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. We have gathered before your word, O oh God, we want to hear with understanding, so give us attentive ears. By the power of your Holy Spirit at work in the word, read and proclaimed, make the meditations of our hearts acceptable to you, our rock and redeemer. Amen. Now hear the first lesson from Nehemiah, chapter 8, verses 1 through 3, 5 through 6, and 8 through 10. All the people gathered into the square before the water gate. They told the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. Accordingly, the priest Ezra brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could hear with understanding. This was on the first day of the seventh month. He read from it, facing the square before the water gate, from early morning until midday, in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand, and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of, of the law. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. Then they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So they read from the book, from the law of God, with interpretation. They gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra, the priest and the scribe, and the Levites who taught the people said to all the people, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, go your way, 
eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions of them to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord and do not be grieved for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The word of the Lord. Now hear the second lesson from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 31. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot would say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. 
The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again to the head, to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with great honor. And our less respectable members are treated with greater respect, whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior member, that there may be no dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then deeds of power, then gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But strive for the greater gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. This is the word of the Lord. The third lesson takes place, or is from the book of Luke. Uh, the fourth chapter, verses 14 through 21. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's faith. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. The word of the Lord. Be I'm sure when Jesus came home to Nazareth, the people had, had questions. I mean, they've been hearing words of, uh, of Jesus doing miracles and Jesus pe preaching in powerful ways and with authority. And, and they wanted to know what's going on because they'd known him since he was a little lad. They watched him grow up. And now all these things are being said about him. And so here he is coming home and at the synagogue and they ask him to preach. And so he reads from Isaiah, and he, he read about the Spirit of the Lord being upon him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, that the oppressed would go free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he sat down, and I'm sure you could have heard a pin drop. And he said to him, today, this prophecy, this messianic prophecy that you've been waiting for, this Messiah you've been waiting for, is fulfilled. And, and I'm sure they were amazed and they were excited that our homeboy is the Messiah, the one we know. He's the one. He's the one we've been waiting for. Now, we didn't read this part today, but if we read just a little bit further down, they go from, yay, the Messiah is our homeboy, to ready to stone him. 
They were wanting to take him out and stone him to death. What happened? Well, he told them that he was the Messiah for all people, not just the Jews. And they couldn't quite handle that. And so they were ready to do him in. This was difficult for the hometown people to swallow. My primary focus for today's message is to recognize that what Jesus was saying to the home folks, the home people, is that, uh, you know, he, he, has, he is the Messiah, and this is his mission statement, what he read, to give good news to the poor, release the captive, to uh, set the prisoners free, to give sight to the blind, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. You know, this is, this is Jesus' mission statement, who he is, why he's come. And... Uh, <coughs> What I want to do is connect that mission statement of Jesus with what Paul is writing to us in Corinthians. Um, if we're going to be a Matthew 25 church, we need to recognize that Jesus' mission statement that he gave, those things that he's going to do, very much tie in with what we believe we're to do as a, uh, a Matthew 25 church, that uh, seeking vitality in the church, trying to eradicate systemic poverty, try to dismantle structural racism, these all fit into what Jesus was about. And if we're going to talk about us being the body of Christ, then we need to be about what Jesus was about. Before I get into a little more detail, let me tell you a little bit about the Corinthian church. They were a dysfunctional church. I mean to tell you, they had a lot of wrong going on. And thank God for that because Paul wrote this letter to address these issues. And by doing so, we learn a lot about what the church should look like, what the church should be and how it should function. And so we're grateful for that. So Paul addressed a number of issues, and most of them centered around being united in Christ, to be one, to, uh, to how they behave with each other. And some of the issues they were dealing with, uh, one, one was they... Uh, they were trying to distinguish themselves from one another with the idea of, I'm better than you. I am a disciple of Paul. These are the ones started the church. Well, I'm a disciple of Apollos. He's the one that followed Paul. Well, others were saying, I'm a follower of Peter. You know, he's, he's the one hey, way up there. And then some were even going beyond that saying, well, I'm a disciple of Jesus. Should we all be disciples of Jesus? That's what Paul was telling them. They were trying to outdo one another. And, uh, and, and, and that's not right. And then there was the issue of, uh, uh, of sexual immorality in the church that Paul addressed, uh, which is kind of like the headlines of today. You know, we read about uh, these issues in churches uh, today. There were lawsuits between Christians, issues over marriage, food offered to idols, um, fighting over spiritual gifts, which is kind of what we're looking at today. The issue here is people were thinking, I have a certain gift that makes me superior to you. You don't have this gift, so you're not quite as good as I am. And, uh, and so the way Paul addresses this is he uses a metaphor of the church being like a human body where there are all kinds of different parts, but they all work together to, um, to function. Now, Paul's not the first person to use uh, the body as a metaphor. A lot of the classical literature uh, used, used this metaphor. But Paul did it, added a little revolutionary twist to it. All the others kind of did it to have a hierarchy of what's most important 
whereas Paul used it to, uh, to, to uh, say, no, that's not how it is. While the others said, uh, you know, that you need to know where your place is, especially if your place is on the bottom. Paul said, no, throw all that out. We're all on equal footing. We're all saved by grace. We, uh, we, it's a gift from God, and we all, none of us deserve it. But God has put us together to function, to do the work that God has called us to do. And, um, you know, in the church, we, we tend to make it kind of hierarchical. We put the pastor on top. And then maybe we have the elders a little lower. And then maybe the deacons, Sunday school teachers. But it eventually gets down to the people that sit in the pews every Sunday. You're, those are the ones at the bottom of the totem pole. And Paul says, no, that's not how it works. Uh, Paul argues that those who appear to have the highest status need the people that appear to have the lower status. We need each other in order for the body to function. And um, again, none of us deserve what we have. It's all come to us by grace. And this was lived out in the early church where the first ones that really came in, they were the slaves, they were the women, they were the people of, social, uh, of lower social class, the outcasts. They were the ones that came into the church the quickest. It was only the social higher ups that came in later. They were the latecomers to the thing. And when we think about the, the church being the, like a human body, do you know how remarkable our bodies are? Uh, the human body has 206 bones, 639 muscles, about six pounds of skin, along with ligaments, cartilage, veins, arteries, blood, fat, and more. Every time you hear a sound or every time you take a step or even take a breath, hundreds of different parts of the body are working together so that we can experience this all as a single movement. Our minds and our bodies work as a unit. And this is how it's to be in the church. We need each other to function. We need to be unified in our purpose and our mission. And this points us back to the gospel lesson uh, where we, we uh, realize that we are connected to Jesus' mission statement. And uh, we need that we need unity, but we also need diversity. We can't do it if we are all the same. If we all had the same gift, it doesn't work. Uh, Paul talks about the ear not being able to say, since I'm not an ear, I'm not part of the body. If we were all alike and we all had the same gifts and talents, we wouldn't be very effective. Now, of course, this, at times this, this causes tension, especially if someone's overstepping their authority. This is why we need a clear purpose and mission statements that, that keep us focused on what we're about. And of course, there'll be times that we disagree. Unfortunately, there'll be times when our feelings might get stepped on and we're not happy. So again, I point us back to Jesus' mission statement that we read earlier. That, and, and by doing so, we recognize that we all have something to contribute to the work of the church, to the functioning of the body. Now, I imagine some of you are thinking, I'm just the hangnail on the body of Christ. I don't have anything to contribute. And that's simply not true. We can try to make excuses on why we might not contribute, but everybody has something that they can give. And uh, it, it could be something as simple as a phone call to offer a word of encouragement to someone that might be discouraged. If, if uh, it, it could be that you just, you're praying for the church. You're lifting up the pastor, you're lifting up the session, you're lifting up people, the deacons, you're lifting up the, the people that are on our prayer list. You're, you're, you're contributing in this way. Just on Sunday mornings alone, we have many ways that people can contribute to the church. Uh, you can, once, <laughs> maybe, maybe once someday, we'll have the choir back. 
And people that sing can be in the choir. And again, this speaks to the diversity of the church and have people having different gifts because you would not want me singing in the choir. But you could be a liturgist. You could be an usher or a greeter. Uh, you could be helping with the tech team and uh, in live streaming. Other ways you can serve on a church committee. You can volunteer with groups. Not everything has to be done inside the building. Uh, you can work toward uh, serving the homeless in the area. You can work with Habitat for Humanity or at school or with hospice. And, and I know that COVID has limited us in many of the activities that we might do to serve. Uh, but someday this will be over and we can feel safe to go out and volunteer in our community. We have a lot of people in this church with wonderful talents and spiritual gifts that can build up what we're trying to do here. Uh, here's one you might not have ever thought of, and that is letting someone serve you. We like to be independent. We like to think we're all on our own. But sometimes we need to let others serve us. It's a way of letting them express their gifts. And this is especially true in an older congregation where there are things that we need. Um, Paul talked about the lesser parts of the body being important and essential to the well-being of the whole. And so we need to allow people to exercise the gifts that the Holy Spirit has given to you and to put them in practice. This past year, we've been focusing on who we are and what, why we do, what we, why we exist, and what is our mission. And, um, and as we look at Jesus' mission statement and discuss what it means to the, be the body of Christ, this is a good time for us to remind ourselves of what is our identity, our purpose, and our mission. And we've been working on this for most of last year. And um, this is what we've come up with. I want to read it to you because it fits in with what we're talking about today. Our identity statement. Who are we? This is how it reads. With gratitude, God keeps us continually reaching out to each other with kindness and to those beyond our con congregation as we seek to answer Christ's call to serve. Our life together as a community of faith is grounded in scripture-based worship, which may take different forms of expression. We treasure our diversity and our mission-focused, valuing our local, national, and international outreach. Our church is deeply rooted, having been founded in 1714. We are part of the mainline denomination known as the Presbyterian Church USA. This is who we are. And there is our purpose. Why do we exist? And for that, we came up with an acronym of love. And I think when I think of love and, and purpose, I, I immediately think of the great commandments. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and, and spirit, and to love your neighbor as you love yourself. And this is why what we put down for our purpose. The L is love God and others, which definitely goes along with the great commandments. We offer spiritual growth and lifelong learning. We are disciples continually to grow and mature in our faith. We value diversity and strive for unity. That's the V. Because we are a diverse church, we bring different things to the table and we are united in, in our, our, uh, our mission and our identity and our purpose. And then finally the E is embrace and serve our world. We are, mission is important to us and we we want to be about serving the world so that's our purpose and then our mission statement what is it that we do and it reads this way our mission is to reach out to one another our community and the world with compassion and generosity we are a matthew 25 church which means we focus activities in order to build congregational vitality seek ways to dismantle structural racism, and work to eradicate systemic poverty. We consider ourselves brothers and sisters in, in Christ and invite all to join us. 
We are the body of Christ, called to be Christ's presence in this community, in this place, and at this time. Amen. We move to the prayers of the people, and our breath prayer this morning is a reminder that we are part of the body. We, as we inhale, we say, I am part of the body, and we exhale, I am needed, because we are all needed to function as a complete body. So inhale, I am part of the body, exhale, I am needed, and in a moment I'll pray. Gracious God, you have called us together to be part of this church, to be the body of Christ in this place. And may we all recognize that we have a role in the body, that each one of us is needed in order for the body to function at its best. So help us to live out our identity, our purpose, and our mission. And may we be bold in praying for church vitality for eradicating systemic poverty and dismantling structural racism, all part of our being a Matthew 25 church. And we recognize that we don't do this alone. So we pray for other churches in our community and the work that they're doing, and may we be able to partner with them in doing the work you've called us to do. But we're not alone just in this community. We're not alone in the world. We have a sister church in the Congo And so we lift them up that they too might be faithfully serving you in their community. We know we're a church in transition and we await the calling of our next pastor. So we lift up our mission study team as they are putting together the mission study. May it be helpful in finding the next pastor. Be with those that will be be elected to the PNC when that time comes. May we have wisdom and discernment on who should serve on that committee. We pray for the next pastor, that you will be preparing that person for this, our church, and that you'll also be preparing us for that pastor. We do want to pray for an end to the pandemic and ask that you keep us safe. We do lift up our prayer list and ask that you be with the homebound, the sick, the dying, and those who are grieving. Be with each one of them and let them know that you are with them and that they will never, and that you will never abandon them. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus, and we offer up the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
would suggest that we exit through the new narthex as opposed to the back doors. That way we can keep those doors shut and the cold out. And then as I've been saying recently, I encourage you to sit down during the postlude and reflect on the ways that maybe God has been speaking to you uh, in this message or in the service. So go into the world and proclaim the good news. Recognize that the Holy Spirit is at work among us, sending us to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, to be healers and a freedom force against all oppression. So let us go boldly as disciples, recognizing that God has called us to work together for the purposes of God's kingdom. So go now in peace with the love of the Father, the grace of the Son, and the peace of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>